What a builder. Thank what you. a builder. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to be introduced instead of introducing for a change. Absolutely. And uh, that's all I've done, really, for about 50 years. I've introduced um, other people's talent. Uh, could there be a, a luckier job in the world, for example, than being on radio? And all you do is a few words into the most wonderful recordings that people have spent uh, maybe hours painstakingly uh, doing in the studios. And they've all kept me going all these years, so I'm very grateful to them all. It's interesting you said that, David, because it's lovely you join us, but when I was thinking about what to talk to you about, really, I was thinking, well, part of the danger, I suppose, is that people will always ask you about who you have worked with all the time, because, as you said, you've introduced so many big stars over the years that there's always that slight danger. So I'm going to do my very best to not take you down that route today. I want to talk about you, the person, really, instead. Uh, and so, I mean, whilst feel free to tell your anecdotes if you want. Don't feel you have to, because I really, I think, what interests me is, is, is you, really, and your career, because, I mean... I guess I mean, people come and go from radio all the time in that sense we're DJs wise but your career has been so long and been so varied and has been across the country so much as well that I, I, guess, I guess I mean I knew you as a personality many 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 years before um, I knew you were a radio DJ you know I knew your TV work if you like before your radio work so to tell us how, how did it all start you mentioned RAF Bridge North earlier we were outside yeah take us go back to those really early years well uh, my my first job in television was as an office boy and um, i was working for atv who were then in uh, rediffusion house in kingsway and uh, i used to collect and deliver the mail for the uh, good and the and and the, the wealthy people like uh, lou grade for example before he became uh, sir lou grade and later lord grade and, um, I, you know, I got chatting to a man called Harold Jameson, who was the head of the script department, and uh, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, really, what I want to do is I want to be a writer. And um, I had written a few articles in a national football magazine, and uh, I had an article published in TV Times about Pete Murray, who was really my inspiration to come into radio in the first place, because I love to listen to Pete mm. uh, on Fab 208, you know, Radio Luxembourg. And uh, anyway, um, I managed to get a job as a continuity scriptwriter, and continuity scriptwriters were the people who wrote the scripts for announcers. And it, it was a fairly menial job, really. I think I was paid about eight pounds a week. Um, and uh, I, the announcers that I wrote for were Peter Coburn, Arthur Adair, and Shaw Taylor. And Shaw Taylor, of course, later became the known as the Whispering Absolutely. Grass Absolutely. On, uh, on, on Police Five. And um, uh, Harold Jameson put it to me this way. He said, you're writing a 30-second continuity script. You must remember that people spend an awful lot of money on a 30-second commercial. So this is valuable time. And, and <laughs> what we're doing is we are promoting our programs that are coming on later that day or the next day. And so you must put a lot of time and effort into it because Absolutely. Um, you know, this is very important time mm. to us. And that's interesting. I, I mean, I, I guess, I mean... Obviously, you started off writing the continuity. So how do you find yourself in front of the camera doing the continuity? Well, then I got caught up for, for uh, my national service, which ah. you know, I know really dates me. Absolutely. And um, I had two years in the RAF, and I, I came up here to do my square bashing at Bridge North, which is uh, just down the road. Absolutely. And uh, then I was very lucky. I got posted to Germany. And um, at the age of 19, uh, I... I went to see the um, station director at what was then called BFN, British Forces Network, which is now BFBS in Cologne. And I said to him, um, this music that you play is wonderful for the officers because they all love Bing Crosby and Peggy Lee, but the troops want rock and roll. Mm. So he said, um, how do you mean rock and roll? So I said, well, it, it's our music. He said, how do you know the troops want rock and roll? I said, I am a troop. So I persuaded him to let me have my own show on a Sunday afternoon. And because we were radiating this heathen music to <laughs> the forces in Germany and also the um, German civilians who loved it as well. And by the way, Elvis Presley was in uh, Germany at the same time. He was, I think, in, near Frankfurt with the American forces. Um, and because uh, we were radiating this heathen music, they followed me with a talk by the Padre. 
and I think he was there to cleanse their sins. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, after listening to this, but um, Heady days. he was very happy because what it did, it gave him an enormous audience because all the troops tuned into the show. And then um, afterwards, they got the religious message. What he didn't realize <laughs> was that when the rock and roll show finished at 5.45, they all pushed off to the canteen and had their dinner. I think he had a, only, only a small uh, fragment uh, of the rock and roll audience, but he was, he was quite pleased with that. And so, and so, were, I suppose when you came, so when you, when you were demobbed then, you came back to the UK yeah. and decided you would try and get into it. Sort of I went back to career. my script writing job at ATV, which they had to keep open. Uh, but I'd been bitten by the broadcasting bug, and later that year, um, ABC Television, who were then the weekend television company here in the Midlands and also in the north, um, up in Manchester, in the Manchester studios, sure. they had an announcer who was um, taking a three-month sabbatical because his mother was ill. And uh, so I passed an audition, mm. and uh, I did my first um, appearance as an in-vision announcer for... ABC television in Didsbury in October 1960, which is now really quite a long time ago. Well, as you can probably imagine, a lot of that doesn't doesn't survive, but uh, uh, well, bizarrely, some bits of your ABC continuity survive. Um, they're, they're maybe not in quite the, quite the form you you expe expect. Uh, you're probably thinking, here, yeah, I'm going to talk about, about a rather large videotape on the floor here, but I'm not. I'll talk about that later, because that, that's a different bit. But <laughs> ma many years ago, when Teddington was being cleared out, yeah. we, we found a film you'd done in 1967 for advertisers. We'd, we'd gone on screen trying to persuade advertisers to actually sell sell their products, and uh, we only only survived on a very old CV2000 domestic reel, but it has some very inter interesting footage of you on it, okay. you know, from all those years back. Um, and also, your your friend Noel has very kindly given us a bit from 1969 as well. So let's have a look at that, Mark. Let's have a look at David in his prime doing some continuity for ABC. Well, at 5.50, there's more chaos in the way in the shape of just Jimmy. Jimmy averaged an ABC network rating of 48 last winter, which is a great record for an early evening show. But comedy always goes down well around this time, so after half an hour of Jimmy, there's more laughter for the next 70 minutes. First, there are two programmes sharing the 6.20 slot. A couple of Mike and Bernie winter shows to start with, and then from the 20th of January through to the 9th of March, a brand new edition of Doddy's Music Box takes over. But I'll let him tell you all about it. Hello again, just a reminder that tomorrow is lift-off day for Apollo 11 and uh, our coverage and our program Man on the Moon begins at 10 past 2 tomorrow afternoon. But now we move along with performer and composer and Anthony Hopkins. So were you writing all that yourself? Wasn't I posh? You were very... Well, actually, I thought, no, actually. I didn't think you were very posh in that. I, everybody had to speak... Very, very if you didn't speak with a standard English accent, you wouldn't get a job on television. Nowadays, continuity announcers all have accents. <coughs> Excuse me, if you don't have an accent, you wouldn't get a job. <laughs> so what you get now is, why I kid a coming up in a minute, like it's a uh, well pet, you know. But in those days, you had, to, you had to speak standard English with a very posh accent. And I remember saying... This is ABC, your weekend television in the north. And that's how we used to speak. And it's unbelievable. You look at it now and it looks so... I mean, nobody talks like that now, do they? I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I think when you, when you put it in the context of the BBC, which were even more... Plummy. Sort of plummy, they really were. You know, yeah. and, and started off wearing evening dress and formal suits. I mean, even, I guess ITV was probably considered to have dumbed itself down there because you weren't wearing a bow tie. You well, know. we did. We did. Yeah. No, we did. When I started at ABC, in the evenings, f after 7 o'clock, we wore dinner jackets and bow ties. <laughs> and when I got to the Didsbury studio, I was... I think I was about 21 or maybe 22, and I'd never ha didn't own a dinner jacket. I'd never worn one in my life. I'd had a very sheltered, <laughs> impoverished childhood, and so John Benson, who was the senior announcer, lent me his jacket. And unfortunately, John is probably about half a foot taller than me, and uh, somewhat uh, considerably slimmer. And so what happened was that I couldn't do it up. It was too tight to do up, and I had to keep my hands under the desk because the sleeves were down to here. <laughs> Did you write your own material? There were, there were the, no. Was that we, written by you as well? We had continuity scriptwriters who oh, wrote right, so, it. Oh, right, so you couldn't write your own material? No, but you ad-libbed quite a lot around it. And uh, the best time uh, for ad-libbing was on Sunday night, um, after Sunday night at the London Palladium, uh, which is a big live variety show. Very often that would underrun 
and you could often be left with three minutes to fill, and all you have is the radio time. So you, I mean, three minutes to camera is a very long time. Absolutely. But in a way, I look forward to it. It's a bit like being a goalkeeper in a football team. You know, if, if, if the ball never comes your way, you never get to shine. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I hope that my defence would let me down. And I would, you know, and uh, so very often it happened and, and uh, out would Shirley Bassey would be singing and she'd decide she wasn't going to do the last number or whatever it was or somebody's act, uh, act had underrun and bomb, there you were, you know, to camera uh, and you've got three minutes to fill and there's the clock. So how do you fill it? I mean, I mean, obviously you've got the initial panic, but what would you, what kind of stuff would you say? Well, you would have ideas, while the show was on, you would have ideas in your head of what you were going to say and um, you, would, you would have the, the TV times and you would have the rest of that evening. The problem was that after the Palladium, there were probably only about three more shows to talk about. And then ABC, when Monday came around, Granada took over as the mm. company. So it was all their shows that you were, I mean, they were glad, obviously, of the publicity. Yeah. But very often you'd be, you'd be getting Mondays, looking at Monday's TV times, and you'd be talking about programs that Granada would be showing the following day. But Howard Thomas wasn't very happy about that. <laughs> well, I think Howard Thomas loved it. The thing about Sunday night was, I mean, at that particular time, to give you a flavour of the time, there were only two channels. There was BBC and there was ITV. And ITV on Sunday night had an absolute blockbuster schedule. You had Sunday night at the London Palladium live variety with the Lou Grade brought over the biggest stars from America, you know, um, Bob Hope and... and um, probably Dean Martin and people like that. You had Armchair Theatre, which was wonderful drama. You had Maverick, the Western, and you had The Avengers, which was the cult TV series with uh, Patrick McNee and people like um, Honor Blackman and mm. uh, Diana Rigg. And so everybody, w something happened then that couldn't happen now, which is that everybody went to work on Monday mor morning talking about the same programs that they'd seen the night before. It is fascinating. Did you, did you I mean, it was it was time of great change, I think, in television, of unexpected change, because it was a time, of course, of the great strikes, and there was lots of, you know, blackouts and union disputes and things like that. As a continuity yeah. announcer, you must have had some very hairy moments in your time when you were about to announce something and suddenly it all vanished. Well, uh, when um, ABC closed, which was in uh, 1968, um, ABC and Rediffusion formed uh, Thames Television, mm. and I went to move to London. I closed down ABC on the Sunday night and uh, travelled with my family down to London, moved house on the Monday, and then <laughs> opened uh, Thames Television on the Tuesday. And we had a technician strike on the very first day, so I opened the station at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and at 8 o'clock in the evening, I had to say, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to bring you the advertised programme, which was a Tommy Cooper show, um, and in the meantime, we will play you some music. And a caption came up on the screen, and we had music for an hour, and that's all people got on the opening night. So, I mean, what a time for industrial action. Brand new television station, on the air for three hours, and then off. And, did you, and the other thing, that, the other side of it, is it a myth, or is it true that sometimes, as an announcer, because it was so hot in the studio, you might have your dinner jacket on top, but you had a pair of shorts on underneath? That was absolutely right. The studio at uh, Dinsbury was a tiny studio. The, the um, television studios were actually in a converted cinema uh, in uh, Dinsbury, and um, the announcer studio had been the broom cupboard. Mm. And, <laughs> yeah, really. And there were a lot of stories that abounded that I got the job because I was the only one who was small enough to fit in there. <laughs> uh, and uh, you had this locked-on camera that was almost on top of you, and you you press this to put the lights on, which you did at the very last mm. minute because it got so hot and claustrophobic. And the first night that I was in there, my heart was thumping like this. You know, my hands were absolutely sweating. And I thought, I don't think I've got the right temper. Uh, I don't think I've got the right temperament for this job because, <laughs> you know, I was just so nervous. And it was very, very claustrophobic. In there. Yeah. Now you mentioned that before I go on to about the rest of your career. You mentioned you said goodbye to ABC, and mm -hmm. people must wonder what this very large tape is yeah. here. Yeah. I'm going to stand up a little, so I hope the microphone can still pick me up, because it, it's quite rare nowadays you actually see a, a two-inch tape that people sort of um, have that isn't actually in the National Film Archive. And we were absolutely amazed when I was talking to David in the very early days about coming to this event, when he said to me, you know, I think somewhat, I, I've got an old tape of my work at some point. And, and so, Julie, you sent me an email about two weeks ago, didn't you? And you said, I, I found yeah. the final ever program I made for ABC television, which I, uh, I, I wrote. And everyone was like, 
And uh, anyway, so so what we have have done and <coughs> is that we've actually done something with this. So, so where, where's Neil? Where's my friend Neil? Neil Ingo, our friend from London there. Okay, he's very good friends with the people who who transfer and restore two-inch videotape. And a few weeks ago, in fact, I think was that a week ago, last last Friday, you both went along, didn't you, to GNG in, in London yeah. to, a, to actually see if this old tape would play. And after all these years, you want to tell us about about this, Neil? Come on, because you were there. And you can explain some of the fun you had when you looked at what had been recorded on this. Incredible, yeah. They just recorded over the top of it, eh? or yeah. wiped it, and and. Uh, but I, I had this in my office at home, gathering dust, and I, you know, I hadn't seen it for 40 years because it was actually transmitted on the 31st of July, 1968, and it was the final program of ABC Television, uh, which I wrote and presented, and um, I think we're going to see it later. We are indeed, but we're going to see it later. It actually uh, is a kind of resume of the years of, um, I think it was 13 years of ABC television. And um, uh, I haven't seen it for 40 years, so um, I, I still haven't seen it, and I'm looking forward to seeing it uh, I'm, I'm to totally today. amazed as to how or why you managed to acquire an actual two-inch of it. I mean, did someone just sort of give you the tape and say, here, oh, you wrote it, so well, yeah, let me have a copy I, of it? I, or? I think what happened was that they said to me, uh, look, you know, keep this as a memento. Uh, this is the, uh, the final program of a uh, television station, major television station, ABC. And uh, they gave me that. Of course, I've never had anything that I could ever play it Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and I didn't think I would ever see it again. It's the sort of thing that you could well chuck out. But, um, uh, you know, I hope you, that you find it as interesting as, uh, I'm, as I'm sure that I will. And, and, and the story gets even funnier because, obviously, Neil and David went along to GNG to actually transfer yeah. this. And when they got there, there was a fault on the two-inch machine. So they were, they were sort of held up, so to speak. So I think it was done actually probably Thursday this week. Literally two days ago, they actually transferred it. <laughs> but they're sitting there talking about it with the, en the engineers. You know, and, and the engineer says, well, what, but why, why do you want to transfer it? And he said, well, you know, final program of ABC on two-inch. Yeah, but we've, we've got that already. <laughs> and they want, pardon? You've got it ready. And it turned out that the same company had transferred the Midlands version of the Goodbye to ABC program ten years earlier. So the other continuity answer who did the Midlands version, Sheila Kennedy, had also got a two inch. Yeah. So we actually have two of them. Yeah. We have we have we have the Goodbye to ABC Northern version, courtesy yeah. of David, and now Kaleidoscope has the Goodbye to ABC Midlands version. Yeah. Courtesy of Sheila Kennedy as yeah. well. So she Sheila Kennedy is is uh, uh, unfortunately not very well, I was told, but um, uh, some time ago she uh, she let them have the, uh, the the guys that we were talking about let them they have this uh, DVD copy, and I gather that the clips of the ABC programs are the same. It's just that um, Sheila and Philip Ellsmore, who were the announcers in uh, the, here in the Midlands, uh, presented the Midlands edition, and I presented the uh, Northern edition in Manchester. So the links are different, but the clips are the same. Absolutely. So, so I mean, it, it just goes to prove, really, and it's, it's a good message to anybody out there, that if you know people in the industry who do have, you know, two-inch, one-inch, 1500 cassettes, CV2000 cassettes, whatever they are, nowadays we can transfer virtually anything for anybody and it's well worth getting it done. I think when you see it on the screen you'll be really impressed by I it. I think I may it's have some more stuff in my office at home for you. I've got, I know I've got some Top of the Pops uh, shows and I know the BBC didn't keep all of absolutely, those. Absolutely. I mean, I find the fact that the BBC got rid of editions of Top of the Pops absolutely staggering really because you know, when you think now, you could sell those programs all around the world. Absolutely. And the fact that the program isn't on anymore, it's still a great brand name, mm. isn't it? Top absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And then just moving on from the continuity side, I mean, obviously we saw a clip there talking about you introducing uh, Doddy's Music Box. And, and you've made several remarks about your height, which is interesting, because the one thing I, I was really worried about coming into this, I was thinking, well, you know, you acquired this nickname Diddy Hamilton, of yeah. course, which Ken Dodd sort of gave yeah. you. I'm mm. thinking, probably, you know, 40 years later, he's sick and tired of people using this nickname, and he'll kill me the moment I mention it. How, well, how, how did I, that come about? I don't, have, don't really have a lot of choice, because uh, when we rehearsed the show, 
Doddy's music box at uh, d once again at Didsbury. Um, Ken Dodd had only seen me on television sitting down and thought, you know, I was quite big. And then he was surprised to find that I was probably about six inches shorter than he is. And on rehearsal, he called me Diddy David. And he said, which, you know, had a certain alliteration to it. And he said to me, took me aside after, said, do you mind me calling you that? Uh, he said, because um, if you mind, I won't mm. do it anymore. But if you don't <laughs> mind, he said, I think it'll stick. And um, I've been stuck with it now for, um, <laughs> 40, is it 40? Yeah, probably 40, 40 odd years. And um, so I think, you know, I don't have a lot of choice in the matter, really. But I think you might as well make the most of these things. So I, <laughs> I, even, I even got my own number plate, Diddy, uh, which I, I've stuck on a Mini Cooper. So uh, I've got this little Mini Cooper, which is a Diddy mobile. And uh, I drive around with Diddy on the number plate. <laughs> Sounds good to me. We're going to have a look, I think, at, at a clip from the, the sole surviving Doddy's music box now as well, aren't we, Mark? Ladies and gentlemen, a, a great many people have found peace of mind through the teachings of the Yaharishi and uh, transcendental meditation. What kind of a man is the Yaharishi? Let's find out now as we meet with his followers, the Yaharishi Doddy. Good evening, good evening. I'm sorry I'm late, little Diddy David. Yes. I was back at the digs darning me doti. Oh, I see. Uh, yes, actually. Uh, Yaharishi. <laughs> Yaharishi! Heaven? Yaharishi. Bless you, brother. That's a shocking cold you got there. Thank you very yes. much. Actually, uh, peace, brother. Peace. Yes, peace. peace. That's very important. Now, if I were to come to you in search of a little peace, do you think you could uh, fix me up? Fix it with a little piece? Oh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, I'm sure we could, brother. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I think... Actually, I but think... brother, brother, you must deny yourself these things. Yes? Deny yourself. It is written. It is written. One must never look upon the wine when it is red. Well, I must say, I rather like the shape of the bottles. <laughs> Dozy, Beaky, Mickey, and Oh, yes. Sit down, brother. Sit down, brother, and take the weight off your queries. Thank you very much. Yes. No, I am. Um... Yeah, hello, oh. yeah. I guess it, it really launched you as a personality, I suppose, it, in front of the camera, outside continuity, because when I looked at the credits for your work, virtually all of it stems from after you'd done Doddy's, the Doddy's Music Box, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it was the first uh, network show that I'd done, and it took me out of the uh, continuity studio, into, and it actually set me off on a, on a whirlwind of personal appearances with Ken Dodd, because at the time, people asked for the two of us together, so yeah. we'd go off opening supermarkets and bingo halls and stuff like that, <laughs> And um, uh, it was, you know, working with Ken uh, was great experience and great fun. And uh, it led to working with other comedians later. I worked with uh, Benny Hill and also with Tommy Cooper. And, um, you know, I mean, Ken was just, it's great as he's still going, still filling theatres. At that particular time, he was the um, Variety Club Entertainer of the Year. His records were you know, topping the charts, tears and happiness and stuff like that. And um, he was a huge star, working with a huge star like that. was. I, I just realised, you know, uh, what a wonderful uh, lifestyle he had. And so you got into doing, I mean, you did quiz shows, I mean, you compared beauty contests. Um, obviously, you did the, the, the circus ringmaster, will work for the Chipperfield sort of circus shows. You know, you were on lots and lots of, of, of panel games. Did you... I mean, I mean what, 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 what was there something you were trying to get to do and you got sidetracked into doing lots of different roles? Was that always your intention, well, to I, work I was, as I widely was, as possible? I was happy to do lots of different things. The beauty contests were, uh, were particularly enjoyable because, as you know, these girls are all, you know, very tall. So I spent most of my time at boob level. <laughs> 
It was great, you know. I'm sure your I, wife didn't approve of it, though. I'm sure she didn't it, have quite it, the same view you did. Well, it did give me a bit of a stiff neck at times, but, uh, you know, it was it was very enjoyable. But no, I, I you know, I, I enjoyed doing lots of different things. Radio was always really my first love, and um, I wanted to have my own radio show. When I got my own show on Radio 1 in mm. 1973, that was a very exciting time. The, 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 it's always typical. The moment you think you've got a complete list of somebody's credits, somebody always turns up with some stuff you didn't know about. And thank you very much, Pete. Well, I had to just show the audience this. That I just love the way they describe you. Do you remember doing this advert? Colourful TV personality. David Hamilton invites you to 33 global holidays to be run with Dylan Colourful World Competition. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, was a, I was a media tart, really. I mean, I'd do anything for money. <laughs> um, you know, ad commercials, advertising, anything. You know, bring it on. That's brilliant. I, I, think, <laughs> I think it's great. And uh, I, mean, I'm sorry, I mean, at what point for like, did, did you make that move? I think it was Radio 2, wasn't it? You take that move in, back into, into radio as opposed to TV then? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd always done radio. I mean, I did a lot of radio and going back to the days of the light program, which mm. probably everybody's far too young to remember here, but it was the forerunner to uh, Radio 1, which came about, of course, because of the pirate stations. And I worked for Radio 1 in the 70s, Radio 2 in oh, the 80s. Well. Oh, and right. then um, after that, I've, I've worked uh, in commercial radio for about the, the last uh, 20 years. Next week, I'm doing a show uh, at a station for, uh, called Big L, which is a tribute to Radio London and actually based in Frinton. Um, which is where the pirate stations were. Uh, you can you can hear it on Sky. It goes out on <laughs> Sky. And I'm sitting in next week for Mike Reed, who's uh, away on a holiday. Uh, he mm. does the morning show. And um, so I'm I'm really now kind of you know ha happy to do. I'm sort of part timer now really. And uh, I do <laughs> I do things for the fun of it. Like being here today this is great fun. And and uh, you know a week of radio down see some pals in in Frinton. You know. Um, uh, but without, you without doing Radio Monday one. to Friday really anymore. You mentioning Radio One it explains a few things to me because of course I mean I guess w w within the things you're probably best known for nowadays obviously the Ken Dodd connection is a massive connection but also the Top of the Pops connection because yeah. things like UK Gold have rerun them so people are seeing a lot of the, of the sort of DJs again so they're seeing Tony Blackburn they're seeing you then we have a clip of Top of the Pops to show don't, don't we Mark as well Let's have a little look of it, you in action on Top of the Pops a couple of times Great, that was the New Seekers, the new New Seekers, with their two new members, Kathy and Danny, otherwise known as Daphne and Canny, and it's nice to have you home again. Do you all like tea? Yes, do you have tea at three every afternoon? We have tea at three every afternoon on Radio 1. Would you like some tea right now? A little bit watery, isn't it? I'm sorry about that. We're going to have a Boston Tea Party with the Alex Harvey Band. How you going to the party? Going to the Boston Tea Party. Going to the party. What a wonderful world, and what a really super guy, too. That was Johnny Nash. Actually, I have a disappointment for our audience here tonight because we were hoping that Tony Blackburn would have joined me, but unfortunately, he had a rather nasty accident this morning. Somebody broke into his personal private library and stole both his books. <laughs> One of them he hadn't finished colouring yet, so it was really nasty. Never mind, to cheer you all up, here is the lovely Cherry from Ruby Flipper, dancing to Dorothy Moore and Misty Blue. Must have been like doing radio on television, really. It's funny wearing the white suit because I remember introducing Brian Ferry, and Brian Ferry was doing uh, "Let's Stick Together," and uh, he came on in a white suit as well. And I said, "God, I said we look like two ice cream salesmen." And <laughs> Brian Ferry was not amused. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me afterwards, he said, "I don't mind you referring to yourself as an ice cream salesman, but I'd rather you wouldn't include me in that." <laughs> he was really, he really had the hump about it. Contrived, shall we say, slightly in places, but but that, that's just the nature of the show, isn't it? I suppose. Well, that, yeah, the, the, the yeah. Boston Tea Party link with it. I mean, yeah. presumably that didn't come from you. That was just the script they gave you. No, so it came speak. from me. I'm oh, it came from you, did it? Oh, right. <laughs> I can't I can't shift the blame onto anybody. Is, is else. this what DJs have to do? It they was, have to find a link. Well, it was a know. crafty plug for my tea at three, which I did in the afternoon show. Oh, so we I were see. Getting, right, we were plugging right. Radio One. But uh, what amazed me about Top of the Pops when I did it for the first time, I, I hadn't done it for a long time. Was it radio? 
I joined Radio 1 in 73, mm. and I wasn't able to do it because I was an announcer at Thames Television. Sure. But, so I gave up that job for a, a year or two to do Top of the Pops, and it was something I really, really wanted to do. I was really excited about, and I was amazed at how small the studio was and <laughs> how few people were in the studio. There were only about 100 kids, and the floor manager used to herd them from one set to another, you know, so it, it looked much, much... It was clever, cleverly shot. It looked much bigger than it was, but actually it was it was all very, very small. It's interesting. I mean... I guess I would. I mean, what comes to mind really is that you were quite a specialist in doing sort of live television, weren't you? I suppose all the radio work gave yeah. you the skills mm -hmm. to think on your feet, to add lib, yeah. you know, to to build that, the, those links. And did you ever feel that that was one of your fortes? That you had that ability well, to do I, things yeah, as live. Yeah, I, I loved I loved doing live television. Of course, having been a continuity announcer where, where everything is live, I was used to it. But I remember one year I made a terrible, terrible gaffe, and I was introducing the world disco dance championships for 1979 and um, at the end of the show the show went swimmingly right until the end and at the end of the show uh, I said and now the world disco dance champion for 1969 and uh, it was 10 because it was 10 years earlier so afterwards the producer said to me he said you bloody idiot he said you've got 69 on the brain <laughs> Okay. Mm. I can't pass any comment on that, really, can, can I? Unless you wanted to, wanted to discuss your private life <laughs> in front of 100 people and a video camera. But if you want to, feel free. <laughs> we could do with the money from the news of the world, to be quite honest, we could. So, so it's, it's not a problem at all. But uh, Perhaps your wife wouldn't approve. <laughs> I, yeah, think, I, I think, was I married? Yes, I think I was married. I think I was on... I think I was on marriage number one at the time. Absolutely, yeah. but I guess I mean it's a fair comment there because I mean you no, did I wasn't. I you wasn't. did I was work between. were you I was right. between marriages? All oh, right, because you did work with an awful lot of different hostesses, and obviously top of the pops was there lots of young girls, etc. Yes. I mean, I mean, was there ever that kind of wow? You're Radio One D DJ, you know? You had the groupies. You are news of the world, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm not that at all. At all. <laughs> I'm just cheeky. That's what I am. You, see. you don't have well, to answer it. You don't have to, to be honest. With, to be sort honest of. with you, yeah, there were lots of groupies, and uh, there were there were, um, you know, it, they were good times. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it never happens in teaching. You just don't get teaching in groupies, well, I hope unfortunately. Not. So. <laughs> <laughs> at least, Absol absolutely. At, at, least absolutely. My, at least mine were all over 16, unlike one well-known DJ that I wouldn't like to mention. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But, but I, I guess, I mean, yes, it was... Uh, and, I, and I guess, I'm, I mean, gosh, I've lost my train of thought completely. Yeah. That's, that's complete, that's complete. I'll take some questions from the audience while I regain my composure. I'm sweating now because that, that, that's quite got me hot under the collar. Any questions before I carry on? Because let's do a few bits. Go on. Um, I, I hear you used to work at Time TV as an announcer. Uh, how did you get to work there? Well, after I was, I'd been at ABC, as I told you, for three months while somebody was away and then... Uh, he came back, and so I then uh, auditioned for a job at Tyne T's Television, and I went up there in 1961. I was there for <laughs> about a year, and uh, I can remember what I got paid for it. I was paid £30 a week, which was 1,500 quid a year, which was, uh, you know, quite good money in those days. And for that, you did everything. You did continuity announcing, you read the local news, <laughs> You introduced programs, you interviewed people, and it was a wonderful grounding. And unlike people today who, you know, go on something like Big Brother and suddenly become big stars overnight with no, they've had no training and no grounding or anything, um, this was a great uh, way to learn, you know, to do everything. And then when the bigger breaks came along, you know, you'd, you'd had the, it's a shame really that that isn't there for people now because, you know, the local television stations now are doing virtually nothing at all. Absolutely. Um, and uh, we've, we've seen the demise of, of that, which, are, you know, is very sad. And all they do now, most of them, is just <coughs> local programs. Whereas, um, uh, you know, we may talk later Absolutely. about Anglia. Absolutely. Anglia is Absolutely. another great, well, all of them, you know, great examples of that. But Tyne was was, was a great, and um, the thing about Tyne Tees television was that uh, up until then, I think any, you know, BBC had local regional stuff, but not for the Northeast. And I think their stuff came from somewhere like 
Northern Ireland. So suddenly they had their own television station and they loved it. And we had uh, fans like, you know, we saw earlier on rehearsal room, but you know, all those mad birds. But fans would be outside the studios and, and queuing up for people to come out. And every lunch day, uh, lunchtime, they had a live variety show called the One O'Clock Show. And George and Alfred Black, who were the impresarios, of lovely, lovely people to work for, um, brought big stars up to Newcastle, people like Shirley Bassey and people that they'd never had the like of those before, you know. And I mean, it sounds hard to believe now because stars, you know, travel all over the place, but they didn't then. And um, it was a great station and I was there in the pioneering days, you know, which I was very lucky to be. It's great. Any more questions? I'm sure there's another one. Some other hands went up at the same time, but... Uh, oh, hey, hey, hey. Everyone's got all shy, haven't they? You mentioned Anglia, and Anglia's an interesting station. We'll, show, we'll see some bits from Anglia later, because I mean, quite a lot of your work survived for Anglia, and that's quite unusual. You know, we can still see you doing quiz shows. We can still see you doing those, those, those beauty contests. Mm. As a station, it always struck me a bit like Time Teach. It was very proud of its heritage. And, and, and your connections stayed, hasn't it, with Anglia, when you did their, their 50 years of ITV show for them? I did, yeah. I went back, uh, was it when we had 50 years of ITV? Of course, it was not 50 years of Anglia. Anglia. Uh, I think they'd probably been running maybe 46 or 47 yeah. years, but yeah. th all the ITV stations were required to do their own celebrations, and uh, I did uh, some interviews for them and then went up and narrated the programme. One of the things that it brought home was, was how much Anglia had done in the past and how little they were doing now. And, um, you know, the wonderful... Uh, uh, what was the... Um, wildlife program that they survival, survival which Anglia did tales of the unexpected sale of the century with Nicholas Parsons um, you know they did everything light entertainment uh, uh, they did uh, beauty contests as you say and now all they do I think is just local news mm. well, did, did you ever feel at any point that really you had a, a regional identity in, in very well known identity in some regions like Anglia or Tynes or Westwood you also worked for but, but in other areas, like, like maybe, I don't know, um, you mentioned the, the Northern Ireland one, one earlier, or even in Scotland, you might have been quite unknown because, you know, you were known for doing certain regions' work. Yeah, I did work in a lot of regions, but then I started doing national programmes like Top of the Pops and uh, Seaside Special and yeah. things for BBC, and uh, then became known everywhere. I mean, always the most difficult areas to crack were places like Scotland, where um, people obviously love to have their own uh, people. Just just coming back for a moment to the uh, Thai and Tees thing, the incredible thing it was that um, although uh, we were broadcasting to Newcastle, uh, Sunderland and Middlesbrough and those mm. areas there, all the announcers had BBC voices and spoke like that, you know. I mean, it just wouldn't happen now. <laughs> Probably a good thing. Well, well, I, I don't know if there are actually any continuity announcers at all nowadays. I think Andy Marriott was one of the very last announcers I think who ever worked doing doing voiceovers in that sense. Because for a while, I think probably until about 1998, some places like like Broad Street in Birmingham had still got individual regional announcers, and it was all merged into LWT, and they did the whole ITV network from there. And uh, well, I can't really be, say I hear many nowadays. There's going to be even more worst. networking in the future. And uh, I heard today that I think um, is it ITV is going to be uh, split up into five different regions, and that's in England, and that's all that there will be. And so there'll be, uh, you know, there was a tremendous amount of work that uh, for equity people, uh, equity members in, uh, uh, you know, announcing, uh, fronting local programs. That whole industry is, has now died out, sadly. Well, what would you feel about uh, about this the, this view? I guess of people having a, a I don't to be rude here in, at all, but having a sort of a certain life doing something. When you mentioned the, the switch from Radio One to Radio Two, that always seemed to me to be a real shame because surely your voice is the same forever. Why why do broadcasters feel this need to sort of move you on to sort of different musical styles or whatever? I think with Radio One, they were all always conscious of the fact that it was uh, a young people's network. And you would get to about 40, and you would be deemed probably too old for it. And uh, so you moved on to, in many cases, to uh, Radio 2. My programme at one time was broadcast on Radio 1 and 2 for economy reasons, and when they got the money <laughs> back, um, I went to Radio 2, and I, I really enjoyed it at Radio 2 until we had a um, head of programmes who came in, 
and wanted to turn it into a, a sort of geriatric music station. Mm. And I was being asked to play uh, Vera Lynn and uh, Max Bygraves, and <laughs> I'd been playing T-Rex and uh, Rod Stewart, you know. So uh, that, was, that was why I left, and I left on a principle. And ironically now, uh, Radio 2 is exactly the station that uh, I thought it should have been then yeah. in 1986. Yeah. It's, it's, I, mean, I mean, you're so right. I mean, to, to me, I mean, meeting you today, obviously for the first time meeting you face to face, I think you, you're, you're as young as you probably were 40 years ago, in that sense of the word. Well, I you think know? Because I think, I think young is about a state of mind, young, and your voice yeah. doesn't change, and I can't work out why they would feel the need to move you on to another radio station in that way. Because well, that would, have, that would have been our argument uh, for you know, preservation or survival, or whatever you like to call it. But, uh, uh, you know, bosses, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, you, there's a kind of, in radio, and probably television as well, there's a kind of... Uh, it's a bit like a relationship, you know, you, you have a honeymoon period uh, and then you have a period when you become part of the furniture, then you have a period where somebody else becomes more exciting and then you have divorce, you know, that <laughs> seems to last about four years. <laughs> But within that context, then, you, I mean, you've actually reinvented yourself a huge amount of times, haven't you? Because, I mean, you've worked, and you still are working extensively, e even now. Well, I'm not working as much as... Uh, I did a daily radio show for 34 years, and, you know, I just got to a point where I didn't want to sit in a radio studio, uh, you know, five days a week anymore. And uh, what I do now is I do a programme called The Million Sellers, which is... I, you know, I sell to various different radio stations, and it's the stories behind that are records that have sold a million mm. from mm. the early rock and roll days through to today. And I go to a studio once a fortnight and record a couple of shows like that. And um, you know, that, that's I enjoy doing that. What yeah. I do now, the yeah. things that I really enjoy doing, rather than thinking, uh, oh, I've got to earn a living. You know. Well, there were times when you had to grit your teeth and think, I don't want to be doing this. You know, you know that I don't agree with what I've been asked to say, or I don't agree with what uh, you, you know or, or this piece well, of music or whatever. And you felt difficult. That, that sort of you felt difficult. I hate. Well, I, d I didn't like the idea of the uh, geriatric music policy <laughs> sure, at Radio sure. Two at that time. Um, and Radio Two now, of course, is great and very, very popular. Um, but I, I worked for a very unpleasant boss at um, Capital Radio, and um, <coughs> without mentioning any names, uh, it was ruled by fear. And um, I worked there for six years, and when I left, I never looked back mm -hmm. over my shoulder. Mm -hmm. I, normally, I'm very sentimental and nostalgic, and I remember lovely things, but I just couldn't wait to get away from there, you know. And that was just because uh, he was a particularly unpleasant person. Most of the people I've worked with have been very nice, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. It's interesting. Any more questions? Any more questions? Go on. I, unfortunately, <laughs> with, with wearing headphones for years, I'm now a bit Mutt and Jeff. So okay, what he's saying is, it, it, obviously, when you were doing your, your announcements or in between acts, what did you do with that time? I mean, would you actually watch the shows or oh, would you yeah. go and do something else or whatever? Yeah, <laughs> being a continuity announcer was the most boring job in the world because, you know, you just sat there watching programmes for hours and hours. And if the programmes were good, it was great. When I was at Thames and they did the world at war, for example, you know, it was fabulous. I mean, I was absolutely glued to the screen because it was such classic television and I've got the whole set at home now. But there were some crap shows as well, you know. When, when that was on, you couldn't leave the studio because if there was a breakdown, you had to be there to apologize for it. So I would, you know, read or, or um, you know, maybe make a phone call and have you to have dinner in the studio as well. Uh, but uh, I, I did it for 20 years. When I gave it up in 1980, I had had enough, and for some time afterwards, I, I didn't watch any television because I was mm. just televisioned out. You know, I'd, I'd had so much. Did, do you, you feel sometimes that, that you've reached points in your careers where you want to close them off in that way and do something different? I mean, I, I come back to the original remarks about Ken Dodd. I mean, obviously, you haven't worked with Ken Dodd for many, many years now, no. you know, in that way. Did you decide a point had come where you said, yeah, you know, I've done that, I wanted something different? Well, I don't think I really made the decisions. I think, you know, it was where, you know, I, I took the work where it came along, you know, and uh, um, somebody would ring me up and say, would you like to do a series with Tommy Cooper? And so um, so I did it. Uh, would you mm. like to do a series of shows with Benny Hill? And so I did it, you know. But uh, like most, um, you know, uh, actors, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really an actor, but, you know, uh, like actors, you, you, t you take the work when it comes sure. along. You're very grateful sure. for it. You know? Sure. It's funny how you ended up doing... 
put a spot about Thames for Monty Python, didn't you? Yeah. I wondered how you got involved with Monty Python. Yeah. Because that was sort of an unusual well, combination. Have you got that clear? We have got it for later. Yes, we have it oh, for right. later on this afternoon. Well, yeah. do you want me to tell the story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah please do. Well, please I, do. I, had, I was working as an announcer at Thames, and um, Thames had a request. Could the BBC use their station ident? Which obviously, you know, the Thames ident had never been shown on the BBC. So they said, in what context? So they said, well, we want David Hamilton, your con continuity announcer, to introduce uh, the Monty Python show. I better not say what it is, or I'll spoil the clip. Won't no, I? no, no, you can say. Oh. You can say well, I, uh, they, the, the, the idea of the sketch was, which opened the Monty Python show, Thames Television ident, and then I came on and said, uh, good evening. Um, there's some wonderful programs tonight on Thames Television, but first, here's a load of old rubbish on the BBC. <laughs> absolutely. And, and your memory is absolutely spot on for memory well, I think that, as well. Which is I incredible. think that's near enough it. It is. And it so is. I went to the BBC Television Centre to record it and, and met the Monty Python gang, which was, you know, great. I mean, I was thrilled to meet them. And then they put me into this little booth or in the <laughs> studio and said, would you record this for us? And of course, it was shown again and again and again. And it came back, and I, you know, it was something again that came out of the blue, but I was thrilled to do. You know? Absolutely. And I mean, it did, it actually, as you said, as I said earlier, it actually, in the whole period of you working with some of the really big comedy stars, you know, and you did Benny Hill, you did Tommy Cooper, they were often in that kind of interviewer type role. Did you ever scream out to want to do something different from that kind of role and think, let me act then? Come on, I want to actually have a go at acting, you know, and be in a sketch well, with you, but, but not as myself. I never really was an actor. The only acting that I did was pantomime, and I did about four or five pantomimes. Uh, and uh, Ken Dodd came along to see me in pantomime, which is very kind of him, at Bradford Alhambra, and he gave me some really, really good tips. I was playing buttons, and uh, he said, you know, you need to work on the pathos. And uh, he said, because, you know, when... You've got to remember that Cinderella... He said to me, you've got to remember that Cinderella is a bitch, <laughs> and she's blown you out for the prince because he's wealthy. And so... <laughs> And so he said, the, you, the audience, you've got the audience have got to be in tears, you know. And and, oh. and so, well, I never got them in tears. But one night, a little <laughs> kid in the front row shouted out, "Marry buttons!" And I thought, <laughs> oh well, at least you know. I told, I rang Ken up and I said, I got quite a good result, Ken. He said, "What happened? Did you get them in tears?" I said, "Well, no." But somebody said, "Marry." He said, "He said you're on the right track." <laughs> Ken, of, Ken, of course, was a wonderful, wonderful buttons yeah. when he was young. Well, because he understands, I mean, the nature of stage work particularly, didn't he? I mean, I think, I mean, a lot of the great sort of musical impresarios came from the stage or background and knew how to work an audience in that way. That perhaps your television is harder because you've got a camera instead and it's hard to react to a camera, isn't it? Well, you know, there are different well, techniques, like you, you, you know, um, in television and, and um, uh, you know, um, live shows are completely different techniques and you get people who who can work on radio but you know can't work on television and sure. vice versa and people can't work on stage so it's a good thing to try and do everything you know because see how far you can you know you can push out the parameters absolutely any more questions hello david um i want to ask you something but first of all i'd like to make a little point you might be able to answer before i moved And obviously, you mentioned Time Tees, uh, television. Um, I know of the Mike Nevels and the Neville Monsleys um, in continuity on Time Tees, but I don't remember those people or those types of people ever having a plummy accent. And as I say, I lived up there 30 years. No, I'm talking about before you were there. Uh, I was at Time Tees in 1961. 61, okay. 61 yeah. yeah. And the <laughs> announcers were Adrian Cairns. Um, John Kelly, Valerie Dennis, and they all had, uh, you know, standard English accents. <laughs> the only person who was there who moved on more to programming was Tom Coyne. Yes. And Tom Coyne was, I think, from the area. But Mike Neville, who you mentioned, actually took over from me. When, when I left, uh, in, I left in uh, 1962, and Mike Neville came in and, because, of course, became an absolute institution in, uh, Absolutely. Uh, the, in the North East. He was, Massive figure. That was his hometown. And uh, he became, and he did Line Yourself Geordie, of course. You remember the famous, um, yeah, yeah. and who was the guy he did that with? I can't remember the name of the... Would it have been Bobby Thompson? Was it George somebody? George House. George House? Yes, yeah. George House. Yeah, that's right. And uh, um, a, a great pal of mine who was up there, who you may remember, was Bill Steele. Remember Bill? Yes. I think he's on radio up there now. He, he does, he does uh, easy listening programs on BBC Radio. 
Yeah, yeah. Bill and I started out together there. He was not an announcer, he was a transmission controller. And when I went up there to do some commercials, when I couldn't do them, Bill did them. And then I recommended him to ABC television, and uh, he appeared there. And after that, he gave up his work as a transmission controller and became a full-time presenter and a very, very successful presenter in the Northeast. He and I are still great pals. Don't see each other very often because we're so far away, <laughs> but if I'm ever in Newcastle, I would certainly look him up. That's yeah. great. And your question was? Do you have your question? Yep. And he moved from the early morning, uh, from the 7 o'clock to yeah. 9 o'clock spot on Radio 1. Mm -hmm. What was it like actually uh, being on at the same time as him? He was on Radio 1, obviously. You were yeah. on radio two. What was it like? Well, it was crazy, wasn't it? It was stupid. I mean, Tony and I had uh, always insulted each other on the on the air and been pals and everything. And uh, he'd been on at the uh, on the morning at Radio 1 and I was on the afternoon. And then they put us on against each other, which was stupid. And then my he, he got my producer at Radio 1 and uh, a guy called Paul Williams. And he came into my, uh, my studio one afternoon and I was playing ABBA. And he started screaming at me. He said, you're playing our music. And I said, hang on a second. I said, are ABBA un under exclusive contract to Radio 1? I said, I think we, we can play them at Radio 2 as well. But uh, that was the sort of paranoia that was going on there. But uh, that was madness. And um, I, I was at nine years at Radio 2, and Tony, within a year or so, had moved off to uh, Family Choice, uh, uh, no, ju uh, Junior Choice, I think, and then Radio London. And, uh, you know, and so, but that's how the business goes. You know, it goes up and down. And, uh, but we were both very annoyed to be put on at the same time and, you know, programming terms, clearly it was madness, you know, we were just going to actually Absolutely. kill each other. Absolutely. Any more questions before, before I finish? Go, go on. Can I just say that I thought your repost to uh, Chris's groupie joke was amazing, perfectly timed, demonstrating <laughs> your ability to think on your feet marvellously. Which joke was that? The groupie, <laughs> the groupie comments. About 69, I suppose. Oh, you teaching, am I? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Demonstrates the ability to think on your feet, um, which is what you would have had to do for most of your career, but yeah. is there a single, singular moment that sticks in your mind where it all went wrong, where you, you lost that? Well, the uh, 69 story itself, was that, that was quite a cock-up, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, uh, there, there were, trying to think of, you know, like really <coughs> bad times or things that, yes, I, I remember when I was doing Top of the Pops, and um, I, I was known as Take One Hamilton. I mean, I, I used to do things in one take. And this particular day, I was introducing uh, Georgie Fame. Sorry, I was no, that's where I got it wrong. I was introducing Rod Stewart singing The Killing of Georgie. And uh, I said, this is Rod Stewart and The Killing of Georgie Fame. <laughs> <laughs> so the studio manager went cut, and he said, it's not, and I was standing on this rostrum, and he said, it's not Georgie fame. He said, it's the killing of Georgie. I said, I know. What did I say? He said, you said Georgie fame. So he said, we'll go for another take. So we went for a second take, and um, I did it again. And I said, the killing of Georgie fame. And he went, and, he, and then I could, I could hear things, conversations were going on. And I was standing on this rostrum there, feeling very, very foolish and thinking, I don't, I don't feel right. Something I, yeah. I don't feel right. You know, I don't know what it is. And um, anyway, eventually with take three, we got it right. And it, it, this had gone terribly, terribly wrong. And uh, it was shortly after that. I had a couple. I was contracted to do a couple more programs. And then my Top of the Pops uh, career came to I just didn't get booked anymore. And about two years later, a uh, um, song plugger from a record company said to me, uh, do you remember the time that you introduced Rod Stewart and you got that? And I said, yeah. He said, well, we put something in your drink in the uh, canteen at lunchtime. And I never, I, throughout my career, I've never drunk before I work. I, you know, I enjoy a drink afterwards, but I never, ever, it was a rule that I had, I never drank before I worked. So I had, you know, like wow. an orange juice or something yeah, like that. Sure. And when I'd gone to the loo, they, they put a Mickey Finn into my drink and I was stoned. I was completely <laughs> out of it. And uh, it, it, you know, ruined my uh, my career with uh, finished my career doing. I did Top of the Pops for about three years, and that was the end of it. And um, uh, that was that was what happened. 
That was awful. It seems almost a sad way to finish a, 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 um, yeah. an interview almost, but I suppose that, that illustrates... I guess we, we celebrate the best, of, the best of the industry, really, but we forget sometimes that there is that side of people, aren't there, you know, in the world generally that can do things like that that are not, not good. The top know, of the pops that, that I have that I have may be that particular edition, so you probably like to. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. You see me going, oh, no, it's top of the pops. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we might know. Well, they wiped it then, won't we, in that case? So, but, but whatever editions they are, we'll be more than happy to, to you know, to, to try yeah. and restore whatever old, old cassettes and tapes you have. I'll finish off with just one, the one we were talking about just before we came here, that you've got an idea for a TV show, haven't you? We, we were sitting here, has given you an idea for a TV show, maybe, to look well, at I, I think some what, sort of what retro. We should do is, I think we should do show. a TV show. Um, showing some of these old programs, and uh, you know, with me talk with me talking about them, because you know, I, I think what happens with retro shows nowadays is that they're hosted by Anton Deck, who couldn't possibly remember television in those days. They're written by a researcher who's probably about 25 and doesn't remember it anyway. And older people find it insulting because clearly they, they, they watch the programs and say, these people d weren't there. They don't really know what they were talking about. Absolutely. So why not have somebody who actually knows the stories, was there and did it in the first place. So if, if you can talk anybody into it, I, I would be well, up to doing it. Well, it's very interesting you said that because the, <laughs> there's quite a move within the industry now from, from, from as you said, people who are say better quality makers of television to try and do something of a higher quality because the whole clip show genre has become a bit of an excuse to try and do something cheap and cheerful really so we will talk more about that would you watch it would you watch it yeah. go, on, go on let's wake them up would you watch it yeah. they are you, like, that's do you, better do you, you think that you, you know it's a bit like a car isn't it which is a car which is an old car and then it becomes a vintage car do you do you, i would like to put a question to all of you do you think that there will be an increased interest in these, what we would call now, you know, old classic television programs in time to come, or do you think there will be less interest? I mean, what do you, what do you, do you think there'll be more? Yeah. I hope so. But the, I, the, 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 in, the interest is growing all the time. I mean, I yeah. talked to Juliet earlier about the fact that even now, 40 years later, shows like Adam Adamant are still remembered by the, pop, by, by, you know, by, by the, by the public. Absolutely. And being shown on BBC4 now, yeah. you know, and being released on DVD. I think the interest there in older television um, is massive. I mean, I mean, when we started off 20 years ago, and we're 20 years old this year, Kaleidoscope, there was probably six of us, you know, and a plastic bag that was interested in what we were doing. And, and we couldn't get TV companies interested. And only one or two people like Len Witcher, who were from at the ABC days, who were at Thames, who remembered the shows we were talking about and, and said, yeah, yeah, I'll dig those tapes out and give you those tapes to show at events. Nowadays, 30 years later, people are banging on our door for information about old, old television to try and use in shows. That the whole, the whole market has changed out of all recognition. Well, you could, do, you could do it as a series, and you could have Juliet, for example, uh, talking about Adam Adamant and stories that went on, you know, and you could have me with my, you know, Top of the Pops, and you could have any number of people who are around from that uh, era, you know, giving you the actual stories behind... Mm. Uh, it is very interesting. When you get the chance to, to let people watch the material properly and comment on it properly, you do get a much, much better, um, if you like, like uh, um, sort of more rounded picture of the industry at the time and your experiences at the time whereas when we tried doing it with Lost Archives and they had this mad idea of running four seconds of a clip and asking a guest to make some you know, a sort of, sort of one line sound bite about it Clearly, the audience wasn't interested in, in watching it, you know. And they turned around to us and said, "Well, what, why isn't it popular?" Well, we could have told them why it wasn't popular. You know, you're not going to get the, the life history of Michael Parkinson summarised in three and a half minutes. No. It's just impossible to no. do. I think it what, never I can think what be. television is worried about is television is worried about being old-fashioned or having older people on there. And so, you know, even when they do something retro. They've got to dress it up with a couple of young people presenting it, and uh, I don't think that's what... I mean, surely it's older people who watch television more than young people, isn't it? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think... Uh, I, I mean, if, for example, I saw somebody like Pete Murray, who I, you know, haven't seen on television for ages, rather than people that you're sick to death of, I would say, oh, great, look, there's Pete, and does he still looks good, and he's, you know, he's still full of... I mean, Pete is now in his 80s, but, you know... Absolutely. I'm sure he's got Absolutely. some great stories. Absolutely, yeah, and... Kaleidoscope, we'll do our best to tell them. What more can I say? David Hamilton, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think Simon's going, Simon's going to leap in hot for you.